the mic on? Welcome uh, everyone who's here with us uh, this afternoon. We are going to have um, a, a, a discussion on one of the most important and, and perhaps most interesting uh, subjects associated with uh, democracy today, which is, will technology uh, destroy democracy? We have uh, three of the most thoughtful people on the subject that we could have gathered. Um, Professor Zhao Yang, we heard you yesterday uh, at the crossroads, and a real moving and passionate speech about democracy and how much uh, people have to fight for it. Professor Zhao is a founder of the China Digital Times, and he's a professor at the UC Berkeley School of Information. We have uh, Mr. Vincent Steckler, who's the CEO of Avast. He's an expert, one of the world's greatest experts in online security. Um, by the way, this uh, session here is co-hosted in the Forum 2000 with the Avast Foundation. And we have uh, Andrew Keane, who's an entrepreneur and an author. He lives in, in California, right, Andrew? Is it? See, now that yeah. he's on to his uh, technology all Sorry. the time. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, there you are. And we're going to talk about that. I was uh, in um, uh, the Bay Area two or three years ago, and I went into one of the last remaining independent bookshops in that area. And of course, you know, the Bay Area is where this internet has been growing and social media and sort of pumping us with information wherever we are all around the world. And there's this independent bookshop called Walden Books, named after Henry David Thoreau, who was the world's, one of the world's most famous environmentalists, as also who wrote the uh, little book on civil disobedience, which inspired Mahatma Gandhi and, and several others. So I found this book there by a person I didn't know, Andrew Keane. It said the internet is not the answer. So here are the three people that we have uh, together to discuss uh, whether technology is, is destroying democracy. I'm from India myself. Um, um, well over 100, over 100 years ago, uh, an Indian got the Nobel Prize for literature, first Nobel Prize won by an Indian, Rabindranath Tagore. And he got the prize mostly for a book that he had produced, it was called Gitanjali, which is a book of songs. And his most famous song in that is Gitanjali, which is the song for freedom. And by the way, um, Rabindranath Tagore was the person who had uh, very strong intellectual debates with Mahatma Gandhi through the time that they were both alive, where Rabindranath Tagore insisted on universal values and told Mahatma Gandhi that his rising, causing people to rise in the name of nationalism was a dangerous thing for the world. And so the debates were very much about what we've been discussing earlier, universal values and nationalism which is rising in the world uh, again today. Rabindranath Tagore in Gitanjali, um, it's a song for freedom, describes that he dreams of a world not broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls. Right now we are seeing walls rise amongst nations. As Donald Trump has explained in the United Nations, there's a case for this. If democratically elected governments are accountable to the citizens that elected them, that means citizens within a geography, then, and they must be accountable to them, then it's perfectly all right for nations to have boundaries and for their leaders to look after only the people within those boundaries. So we're seeing the walls rising amongst nations. We're also seeing fragmentation, walls rising within nations, between people who have different religions, different ethnicity, different cultures, and people then ex escaping or wishing to escape from oppression within their national walls are now finding that the walls of other nations are closed to them. They cannot get a relief because of the walls that are rising. And a third set of walls is rising between people who 
let me say, think like us, that there should not be these walls, we should be one universal human race, and many others today who are not happy with this liberal view of the world and the populist arising about uh, that we are different people and we must look after ourselves. So we have people, as Tagore feared, who would be div divided by many walls and not able to, to live together uh, peacefully. Tagore in Gitanjali has another line that he dreamed of a world where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit. And he was noting, what we have always noted for thousands of years, that we have in our minds stereotypes that we make of others and we project onto others. And I think that social media, and this is where I come to what you wrote about, Andrew, social media, instead of opening up our minds, is closing our minds into communities of people we like and whom we follow. And around this wall, or across this wall, we lob insults at people on the other side. Last week, two of the most uh, respected lawyers in our country, in my country, India, in a case before the Supreme Court of the country, where they were friends of the court, to help the court decide in a matter which was to do with the incitement of hatred, and uh, some Muslims in the country were uh, put to death by the majority community. And these two lawyers appealed to the court to please do something about controlling social media. They said it's inciting so much hate. This technology which was supposed to make all of us listen to each other and open the world to us is dividing us so hard. And one of those lawyers, uh, the most famous, he said that he's shut down his own social media accounts because he couldn't take any more the hate that he was getting on it. And the judge of the Supreme Court then responded, he said, we also are wondering what we should do. We've been putting our judgments out, and on social media we find sentences taken out of those judgments out of context. And the hate that is being generated to the Supreme Court because of what we are supposed to have said, is, is resulting in a lack of respect in democratic institutions. So there's a rising of fear, and the head cannot be held high anymore. So that's the context today, and Tagore, of course, feared that um, we were like that then, but I think we might be becoming even worse. And because of, and that's my, my challenge here, is technology, which is supposed to make us come together, it is dividing us. We are going to organize this discussion around two big questions. We're looking at this complicated issue about technology, which should be good, which is spoiling democracy, which we all want, through two lenses. One is the question about what technology is doing to our minds and our social relationships and to the quality of the public discourse that lens. The second is, who owns technology? And how can we regulate the use of technology so it's not used by those who own it for their own ends? And these could be governments, and they could be large private enterprises also. So what we would be doing is first taking the first lens into this subject of technology and democracy, and I'd be asking our, our three eminent panelists for their thoughts, and then I'll introduce the second question the second lens and ask them for their thoughts. And these things, of course, are connected, but I thought we'd just clarify in our minds what we are wanting to, to understand, and then ask yourselves for your thoughts and your questions. And then, finally, I'm going to ask our three panelists who will be listening to you and responding to you for what are the three solutions that we have? How can we harness technology to improve democratic discourse as well as the solutions we might have about how we can regulate technology and governments and businesses that use the technology. So having heard then your three solutions, and they might turn out to be the same or different, I will attempt then to say what are the three ahas that have come to me from this discussion and from your comments earlier.
So we're going to go into this uh, right away. I have to make a couple of announcements at the end, and I'm going to be reminded to, to make them, because you, I've got something interesting to look forward to even after this discussion about the subjects that we are discussing uh, today. So let me begin that way, uh, Michael, as I, uh, Andrew, as I mentioned. I was quite taken up by a book which I've read and annotated, and by the way, quoted and acknowledged you. And so, so what is technology doing to our minds, our social relations, and to the quality of public discourse? Well, that was quite an introduction. I've never heard a moderator speak so long. Um, and, and it was a very good, I, I don't mean that to be rude, uh, it was a very good introduction. You, know, you set, set out the stall very well, of course. Um, I, don't like the, I don't like the title of this. What is the title of this panel? Um, will technology destroy democracy? Yeah, it's a t I don't know who came, is there anyone here who came up with this title? Are they responsible? Um, they would admit it now. I think it's a really bad title because it creates immediately this notion of technology as being this bad force and human beings being this great force. And that somehow these bad guys, whether it's technology or the Russians or the Chinese or this group or that group, they're the ones ruining everything. And, it's, it's a, and I, I admit, in some of my work, especially my early work, I was a little guilty of this too, because it's very easy to demonize technology, because technology can't speak for itself. I can trash technology, but there's no, there's no one in the audience called Mr. or Mrs. Technology who can speak back. Um, technology doesn't have a voice. Uh, so I think we should be really careful with this question. I think maybe, maybe some of the other uh, panelists want to uh, help with this. I know Vincent will hopefully be on my side here because he manages a technology company and, and you build technology. Uh, but it's really important to remember that technology is us. The technology, we didn't just wake up one morning in 1995 when I started Audio Cafe and technology was delivered to us by the stork in the middle of the night and there we had it, the internet. And our lives were wonderful before that, and then suddenly the internet came along and your presentation of social media is this thing that divided us. It's not what happened. Technology is our product. We create it, just as we make this tea and these tables and weapons and medicine, many, many good things and many, many bad things. So I, I think it's, it's a trivialization of technology to suggest that technology is ruining anything, especially democracy. Because democracy has always depended in one way or the other on some kind of technology. I mean, even in Aristotle's polis, which was the first, perhaps, model of democracy, there was a kind of technology. You can't have democracy without technology. It depends on the kind of technology you have. And I would also take issue with your idea that somehow technology is dividing us. Uh, I don't even know what you mean by that. I mean, you talk about digital technology, because I could switch on my TV and the echo chamber of, I mean, in, I come from the US, so I don't know what it's like in, in the Czech Republic, but the echo chamber of Fox News and uh, MSNBC um, and, and, and CNN in many ways is just as shrill. So we do have a crisis. I'm not saying everything's great. We do have a crisis in terms of democracy. The failure of people to talk to one another, the growth of narcissism, an inwardness, uh, a cultural crisis of of many forms, the personalization of, um, the personalization of, 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 of our being, um, and above all else, the inability for us to talk to one another and listen and be sympathetic and have a civil kind of discourse. So I would agree with you about that. But the notion of blaming technology, I think, is deeply troubling. I think we have to understand, for example, that social media was created for us and it was a noble enterprise. In many ways, it's failed. But there's also potentially ways in which technology can actually solve these solutions, or at least us allied with technology. And uh, you were very nice to plug my first book, uh, my last book, uh, which was called The Internet is Not the Answer. My next book, which is out early next year, which I hope will also be published uh, in, in the Czech Republic, is called How to Fix the Future. 
So rather than focusing on uh, the problems, I, I focus on solutions. And I think democracy can also be fixed by many of these things. So let me, let me be uh, a naughty boy and suggest that the, uh, the title isn't so good, and maybe we can think through a better way to frame this question. Thank you. Professor Young? <coughs> Thank you for uh, your kind of words that, uh, about my yesterday's uh, remark. And also, i very surprised, uh, happily surprised to find out that you quote uh, also my favorite Indian poet. Yeah, uh, the, I never know how to pronounce his name. Uh, Tagore? Ta Tagore, yeah. Tagore, right. And as a matter of fact, my first blog, uh, I used the quote on the, my blog title in Chinese, so something called uh, the closest place to you is the furthest, f further, furthest, something like that. Uh, that you at here today uh, could be mean truth. Right? Uh, the closest place to the truth probably the father, have the farthest to travel. Uh, that what I, our point in India said that you know, uh, in the last century or long time ago, but that's even more true today in the social media world. Um, before I <coughs> say a couple of things about technology and democracy, maybe I, uh, I listen to you, Andrew, <coughs> and I want to uh, say a, a, a different, <coughs> differ from your, one of your statements, which is technology doesn't have a voice. Uh, we both live in, in the Bay Area. Uh, I have heard so many different voices advocating their technology uh, uh, because uh, uh, simply it's because these are the, uh, the venture capitalists, right? They have to sell their particular technology and the capitalists to describe how this technology, how wonderful, whether it's a search engine, it's a data mining, it's a database, whatever it is, yeah, uh, 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 that how good it is for society. Right. So in that way, uh, there is a voice, commercial voice for it. Whether it's the right voice, whether it's an absolute truth, or well, away from the truth, that's a different question. That's what we're here debating. Um, another, so my background is, uh, I studied actually astrophysics when I was a student, uh, but I became a human rights activist after Tiananmen. Uh, but about 15 years ago, I switched my career from running a human rights organization to teaching a school of journalism, but dive myself into the new media and technology at UC Berkeley. Uh, one of the very fundamental reason is that many people like me as an activist see the hope in technology, in the, in the rise of communication and information technology. We see that this will empower us, this will empower the democracy or the activism. Uh, and uh, even in, in the democratic countries, I heard a lot of those uh, 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 optimistic voices, such as you know, the internet, of, unlike TV, yeah, can uh, uh, democratize the, the, the playground, uh, equalize the playground, and then uh, maybe empowering the deliber uh, deliberate democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, 15 years later, can those optimism simply be replaced by pessimism? Or were taken by surprise and, 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 and sit back and say, wow, tech, those technology not only makes people connected and uh, can communicate with each other, they also polarize the public sphere. They also full of manipulation of public opinion. They also can be used uh, 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 to undermine democracy, not just in some cases, uh, uh, enhance the democracy? Can they be used not only just by the activists that to expand freedom of expression in the authoritarian regime, but also used by authoritarian regime to control, to surveillance, and to persecute, intimidate the population? Both are true. Now we're in the much more real world. It's not a simple Techno opinion, uh, 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 utopian, yeah, the, the optimism, nor it's 
uh, I agree with Andrew said, simply just uh, uh, pessimism about the technology is only bad. Uh, we are, we have to examine where we are. We are facing challenges, but at the, where do we start? The challenge is humanity. Dignity, truth, empathy, those fundamental, even sense of beauty, those fundamental quality of human lives that now uh, are being somehow uh, 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 being placed in this sort of technically uh, 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 Right, right uh, plugged in the world, right? Like my cell phone's right here. Everybody has this thing, and how many applications on this? Uh, you know, how many generations later? Maybe the baby just need to put a chip there. So, uh, in the Bay Area, I heard full of those talks. Now, let me just say two things about uh, 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 the topic, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass to the next speaker. Uh, my sort of narrow area in this uh, is about China. In the authoritarian regime, it is about manipulating and control the public uh, 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 sphere, uh, especially using the combination of not only censorship, intimidation, but uh, I would call computational and human coordinated propaganda. Yeah. It towards the both domestic population and towards external, such as the uh, Chinese government has direct coordinated those kind of propaganda campaigns towards Taiwan. Yeah. Well, this has been happening for a while. Now, in the United States, or in many other countries, we see uh, how the compu com computational propaganda uh, uh, approach can be used, even manipulate, for example, 2016 US elections yeah, by another country, like Russia, or uh, there's other different examples in the world. Um, so this is really worth to look into. Yeah. Not only the internet or the communication technology help us to communicate each other, to expand our information access, but also how it's undermine our perception to the world, uh, undermine the reason and the rational and, and the public sphere uh, uh, as, as a public discourse. And one more thing, just to look into it. We're not talking about just so-called fake news, the content itself. Yes, there is, well, I, I don't like to use the word fake news, but there is full of sensationalism, extremism, conspiracy theory, uh, 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 commentaries in disguise of news. The full of those things cannot be checked, spread on the, on, on the social network, the internet. Not only the content. But also we have to look into very carefully how those content being spread and disseminated through the social networks, through the friends, through the family circle, through the professional so connections through on the internet. Those networking structure, such as on Twitter and Facebook, enables a certain pattern of information propagation, which is, can be manipulated or enhanced by the people who knows how, and particularly controlled by the technology companies. So we need to look into more than just the content itself. And we are only at the early era of this new communication power uh, time. Thank you, thank you. Vincent. Okay, those two are gonna be hard to follow up on. I don't know if there's anything left to address. Um, you know, following up on, uh, on Andrew, that, um, you know, I've always viewed that technology uh, is a tool. And, you know, throughout civilization, we've had uh, different tools going back to printing presses, uh, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's how it gets used. Now, when people start talking about, you know, how is technology impacting democracies, if we'd had that discussion two years ago, everyone would have been talking about the positive benefits, Arab Spring, the use of Twitter, the use of Facebook to help bring a, about regime change. And then, of course, when it became clear that even though regimes changed, but there wasn't anything in place to actually um, you know, have a solid uh, regime, uh, that kind of fell apart. But then with the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, people usually get more focused on 
you know, was technology an enabler of affecting the results uh, of those elections? And um, as an American, uh, I would say no. Um, I mean, we had a case of two tremendously unpopular politicians, or not politicians, uh, uh, you know, candidates. Um, uh, you know, I don't think any time in the history of the country have two candidates have uh, negativity scores in the 60%, you know, in the 60% of the people didn't like them. Um, but, you know, we get all this news right now about, you know, Facebook had been hiding the, all these ads built, you know, bought by Russia-linked organizations. I think now it's $100,000 of ads. As someone who buys ads on Facebook, I can tell you $100,000 gets you nothing at all. Uh, that gets you somewhere between 300 and 400,000 clicks. Of those clicks, you're lucky if 30 or 40,000 people read uh, what's there, and you're lucky if maybe one or 2,000 repost them or send them anywhere. Uh, it's, just, it's just noise in the system, and blaming technology, I think, makes, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's saying people are stupid, and, and they're not. There's a real interesting study out of Pew uh, a few months back on, uh, you know, it's a U.S.-centered study, but on, on, on how people get their news. And the U.S. news is still dominated by television, the echo chamber of Fox News, as uh, Andrew brought up. And getting news through social media, it's pretty new. And of course, uh, the uh, younger generation, like my kids, um, yes. But still, across the population, it's very small. I think it's less than 20% of people rely on social media for news. And what's real telling is virtually no one believes news they read on social media. The, 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 uh, it's only 4% of people say that they have high trust and what they, uh, in, in news that they see on social media. And it is because it's all, you know, so much of that news is at the extreme. And it's interesting that a majority of people don't like the fact that they're only given news by Facebook or YouTube, etc., about things that Facebook thinks they're interested in. That is the echo chamber effect. Uh, although that is more prevalent, uh, it turns out, with the uh, older Republicans like the fact that they only see news that they like. The uh, younger generations you know, prefer seeing a mixture of news. So I think people are a lot smarter than we think, and they can separate a lot of the uh, wheat from the chaff on all of this noise about social media and advertising and planted stories, etc. Now, technology, of course, has allowed fringe believers to have much more visibility, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they attract more supporters. For example, Daily Stormer, which was kind of the far right-wing neo-Nazi website in the U.S. that got kicked off the internet, or at least the, uh, the public internet, uh, after the Charlottesville um, riots. Um, they're still there. They're just uh, below the radar. You got to go on tour to get them. But the, the, uh, but the people who believe them and support them uh, can still see them. But it, so on one side, it may be good that they're not there. But on the other side, um, you know, uh, if normal people can see it, they would know how abhorrent they are. And now they're allowed to cultivate in the darkness rather than uh, being exposed to public scrutiny on the web. So lots of things that in the olden days were passed by, by, by uh, mimeograph sheets or um, you know, in, in dark rooms somewhere uh, are now done on the internet and it has more visibility because technology has enabled the uh, visibility. And as far as the quality of discourse, once again, as an American, I can't think back to when there was good public discourse uh, in the U.S. Maybe uh, you know, uh, before we had fewer uh, news stations and you had just three major networks, which were somewhat balanced about what they talked about. They weren't far left, they weren't far right. Uh, but nowadays, you know, people self-select what they want. Um, you know, if they're real conspiracy theorists, they read uh, Breitbart News. Uh, if they're kind of only partially like that, like my mother, she listens to Fox News. If it's not on Fox, it's not correct. Um, and, and you get that throughout the spectrum, but yeah, it's, it's, people, uh, it's people doing it to themselves. And I think 
one of the things with tech, when we start looking at Twitter and Facebook and online commenting and flaming people, yeah, it, 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 it's almost like a, like a rabble. But if you go back to Marshall McLuhan um, with, uh, with uh, the medium is the message, uh, now, of course, he died long before the internet came out, but the internet to him would probably be a, a pretty cold medium, that it doesn't, it, it doesn't require much engagement. I mean, what engagement can you drive in 140 characters or a sentence or two uh, on a Facebook uh, posting? That, you know, that the best media are ones that engage the mind, and it was reading or radio. TV was a, a very cold medium. Um, and, uh, you know, these instantaneous chats on the internet, um, even more so. But I think on balance, you know, tech is just enabling what societies want, other, which, as Yao brings up, is a negative. And I have a much bigger concern about the government use, not just totalitarian governments, but you got very legitimate governments like Germany trying to police what's on the internet, you know, extending Germany's uh, uh, domestic hate speech, hate speech laws to the entire internet, or the EU with the right to be forgotten to extend to the entire internet. If a legitimate government like Germany or the EU can do that, then, uh, then why can't all governments in the world insist that the entire internet must follow their own domestic laws? And I'm much more concerned with the government getting in uh, than I am with, uh, you know, what people in general do on the internet. Well, thank you. Um, what um, I'm hearing, and I guess you're hearing the same, is that uh, um, technology is uh, neutral. It a, it's, uh, doesn't uh, uh, think for itself, at least not so far. Um, we humans develop technology, we humans use technology, and we humans, if you wish to, must harness technology, and, and we've always done it. When nuclear energy was discovered, it was a technology with great possibilities. We're still struggling in how to regulate the use of nuclear energy. I'd go further back, electricity. And we have great regulations about the transmission of electricity and the use of electricity to prevent harm, which are otherwise very good technology uh, is also doing for us. So we are at a point where I think, and I would now, based on what I've heard, I congratulate the organizers of the forum for putting this question. Will technology destroy democracy? I think we should consider it now. We need to consider the force of this technology, both good and falling into the wrong hands, evil. And what are we going to do to, to regulate it? Before we go to that uh, question about uh, uh, in whose control is this technology and how could we regulate the use of it. Let me just explore further this uh, uh, question of uh, technology with democracy. As Andrew said, democracy uh, fails when people fail to talk to each other. Uh, I would say when people fail to listen to those who are not like themselves, democracy is failing. It's not a matter of having elections or not having elections. It's we as people, if we cannot uh, uh, listen to each other, uh, let, us, let others live with their dignity and their identities, uh, we've destroyed democracy, the essence of democracy. And Andrew mentioned also a narcissism, which uh, in your book you put very well, uh, Andrew. Um, it, the internet somehow and the social media encourages um, more narcissism, perhaps. So, and these are qualities which uh, prevent solidarity and respect for each other. It's about me and myself and my fame and the number of people that, that follow me. I'd like to explore that further and I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor, how you uh, have been uh, thinking about this, about how technology is polarizing uh, the public sphere and some people manipulating. Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, there's a couple of things uh, uh, relating to this, right? Um, at the uh, sort of th in a theoretical level of the de uh, d democracy or democratic society, you know, if you read Habermas about public discourse, uh, uh, these are sort of based on exchanges, the equal and rational based uh, discussions. But on the internet, uh, we know that's not the case. It's full of emotions. Uh, emotions is contentious. Uh, whether it's a hatred, whether it's suspicious, whether it's sadness, uh, whether it's anger, uh, it spreads. Yeah, whether it's humor, laughing. 
Yeah. Uh, and also that we are not only just thinking by the rational uh, 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 level, like right? images. Uh, you mentioned that, that, that the few, you know, well, 140 characters maybe not, uh, uh, it's a cold media. But now it's full of multimedia, uh, 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 YouTube, uh, little clips, uh, uh, images. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I was looking at the angle of, well, this gives those people that who uh, less privileged in the society or uh, uh, a power, right, uh, from an activist point of view. Uh, but later on I realized, well, that's not only true, it is true to a certain degree, but it's also empowering some companies that, that are holding those social platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, or having enormous power, Google, have enormous power to sort of, you know, uh, uh, to, to possess such information and have the potential to do something to it, right? Now they use that capacity to add to you, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a commercial exercise, but the, the, the potentially there's a lot of things. And also can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. And it also can be, uh, uh, it's empower the state uh, uh, that can, can put surveillance and manipulation on, or even one state towards another. Yeah. Uh, then the, this, this whole a new world becomes much more unpredictable or, 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 or troublesome or challenging than simply to say, oh, you only see the part good for your cause, but you have to see the entire picture of it. Um, so talking about the uh, polarizing the public sphere, uh, it's important to think that essentially we're talking about democracy here, we're talking about the, the preservation or influences uh, uh, even propaganda, uh, um, disinformation, uh, all these concepts are not new, but somehow being uh, amplified uh, unequally, unequally in the different sectors uh, of the society in, in a different context. Yeah. So we need to, first of all, we need to understand that context better. And to then to look at what's our ultimate goal, what's make a democracy functional. Yeah, uh, uh, and healthy. Uh, and then we should look into what makes those polarized, uh, 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 the, the, the sort of public opinion uh, 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 segments and islands and full of even hatred and, and those. Uh, it's, it's, it's a human, it's a human emotions that are being uh, spread on the internet. Uh, emotion is, is what humans are, but just also, we are rational, and we are also have a more critical thinking faculty. And how does that being further harnessed on the a social media platform is a challenge. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, uh, um, I, I learned a lot from your book, and I'm looking forward to the next one with the solutions. Because you have described the problem very well, and I think the professor is confirming that very well, that um, 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 Facebook is not merely a technology platform. It is a media business, yes. And uh, now Mark Zuckerberg is realizing that and that, you know, he's accountable for what's happening on Facebook. And he says, okay, yes, we are going to be now having better algorithms to prevent bad things being said on, on Facebook. So who's designing these algorithms and what would they say are the bad things which can be or should be excluded and what are good things that shall be permitted. Um, so what are your thoughts about um, the, the regulation of, uh, of the conversations on, on social media? Um, well, let me just address a couple of other points first and then I'll get to that. Uh, firstly, I didn't say that technology was neutral. I think that's, that's a really banal thing to say. People always say it, but it's meaningless. It isn't neutral technology. Technology is created by us and is infused with values, cultural, economic, political, like anything else. So it's not neutral. Um, and the internet that was designed in Silicon Valley in Northern California is in many respects a kind of an ideology. It, it, it's built around the, e a lot of people have written excellent books about this. There's one person in particular, Fred Turner at Stanford University. He wrote an excellent, if you want to know the history of Silicon Valley and the internet, it's this book called From, uh, Count From the Counterculture to Cyberspace. 
It's a classic book of its kind. And he showed the way in which the values of the counterculture and their hostility and resistance to authority and traditional mediators were constructed into technology and particularly into the internet. So I, I don't know where, I, I've never said that technology is neutral. It isn't. But when I say technology doesn't have a voice, what I mean is technology can't speak. People can speak on behalf of technology. Technology companies can say, well, we represent a certain kind of technology. My point simply is that when we blame technology for the crisis of democracy, we're not really blaming anything. So we might say, well, we blame technology companies, we blame technology platforms, we blame technologists, or we blame internet users. Those, those are more meaningful phrases, but this word technology is meaningless. But it does not mean that technology doesn't have values. Um, I think in terms, it's important also to remind ourselves of the way in which technology is changing democracy. The ideal of the internet was to disintermediate. That was the dream, the notion of doing away with experts, doing away with the authorities, having this intimacy between users and between uh, technologies, uh, and users and their technology. This is, and in terms of democracy, it's really important to understand that we've had these debates before. Um, the beginning of the 20th century, for example, the great German sociologist and political thinker Max Weber, when he was imagining what German democracy should look like after the First World War, wrote a series of extremely good pieces and articles about the advantages of representative democracy over direct democracy. And the kind of what Weber called the plebiscitary democracy that he thought would necessitate or would create with crowd frenzy and authoritarianism and dictatorship was unfortunately created in some ways in Weimar Germany and of course led ultimately to the rise of Nazism. This is not just a 20th century phenomenon. Aristotle in his book Politics, perhaps the first person to write coherently about ideas of democracy, even though he wasn't a great fan of democracy, argued that the problem with democracy was it lent itself to what he called ochlocracy, which is the rule of the mob, the rule of the crowd. And, that's, and, and out of the rule of the mob and the rule of the crowd, you got dictatorship, you got authoritarianism. So the irony of, di of democracy, according to Aristotle, was unless it was controlled and managed carefully, it would lend itself not to the voice of the people, but to the voice of a person, a single leader. And I think that's the problem, the kind of uh, ironic consequence of the well-meaning work of the architects of the internet, is that they thought they were disintermediating, they thought they were giving a voice to the people. But actually, democracy, um, democracy requires coherent, working democracy requires representatives. So when Vincent talks about the crisis in America, and I agree, I don't think, you know, I think America is a, is a catastrophic example of a political system. Whether you call it a democracy or not is arguable, but it's a dysfunctional country which has created not only a, a catastrophic president, but also a catastrophic co uh, Congress and a political culture that just doesn't work anymore. Um, the, the point being that that, dis, that disintermediation of authority has gone hand in hand with a culture which also doesn't trust elites. So whether the internet is a cause or a consequence of all this, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell where this begins and where it ends. But what it's contributing towards is the rise of a kind of plebiscitary democracy, a rule of the mob. And therefore, it's not surprising that out of our sort of digital culture, we're seeing more and more authoritarian leaders. So again, when I say, I don't want to blame technology for what's happening in the world, but when you want to understand the crisis of democracy and the shift from representative democracy 
with its trust of political elites and political parties, to our increasingly plebiscitary kind of culture, the internet is both a central cause and an effect. So let me, that was, I didn't answer your question. Very finally, very quickly, I don't want to keep on talking. I strongly disagree with Vincent. I, I can't believe he has the nerve to say that government should keep out of the internet. It's an, a, 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 to, to me, the internet is just as a legitimate source of government control and laws, conventional laws and government control, as anything else. So I think European government, for example, has every right to legislate the internet in accordance with the laws of the EU or the UK or the US. Now, when it comes to countries like China or Russia, whose political systems I think are appalling, that doesn't mean that I applaud the Chinese or the Russian government's decision to turn off the internet or use it as a means of destabilizing the West or creating a tyranny in their own countries. But I do believe that the, in, a, in, a, in a viable constitutional democracy, which I think for the most part still exists in the West, government has every right. And I think when it comes to, say, the EU decision to create a law of forgetting, I think that's an interesting development. What the EU now is developing a very, very coherent law in terms of protecting people's rights. And in our digital era, big data, we need that. So I applaud the government. I think the problem with our kind of digital culture and the kind of libertarianism that is both a cause and an effect of this is some people think that governments have no rights, no responsibilities, no rules. Some people think that those elites have fundamentally failed. And if we believe that, then all we have left is the mob rule. So what we need to do is improve the rule of law, improve democracy, representative democracy, rebuild our parties to reflect the realities of our socioeconomic age, but not to reject the whole thing and not to say that the government shouldn't interfere in internet law. I applaud that. All right, I think uh, we're set up for you, but let me uh, throw a word in here. It's a word about uh, listening, listening. Uh, on the, uh, the, the, the internet, uh, I wonder in social media how much listening there is really. There's a lot of speaking and tweeting and, uh, and as you said, I mean, who listens because there's so much happening that you can't listen to everything, so very few will follow you. So very little, even that level of listening, but deeper listening to the emotions and the feelings of people. This technology is not designed for that. We need to have other dialogues um, in which we are looking each other in the eye and contradicting each other and, and respecting each other's views. Uh, and then we can really listen and, and develop something together. So that's democracy probably. And the internet by itself will not create a better democracy, but listening, listening. And uh, the session after this uh, is going to be a very nice session in this room itself, which is, uh, it's an experiment. Is my microwave spying on me? It's listening to me. So all the, the social media and the internet, our concerns are about uh, uh, the government spying on us, even the US government. My data, my privacy, my ownership of myself and my data, and so listening to us. Are we listening to each other? No, but are some other powers listening to us? And that's where I think Andrew comes in and says we have to have some regulation about who's using all this data that we are putting out voluntarily on the internet. Should it be the government? Or can a private company be trusted to do this? This is for me to jump in yes, now? Yes, yes. Good, so, uh, so listening was a good segue because I either didn't say what I meant or people didn't listen and hear what I'd said, which is, you know, uh, as we get the rise of these big companies who are kind of masquerading as media companies, you know, call it Facebook, YouTube, Google to a certain extent, um, you know, a number of them in China, et cetera. You know, they're, uh, they're, they for the most part are claiming to operate a, as platforms. And that's to really enable their, their business model where they can essentially get content for free and sell advertising against the eyeballs who are uh, consuming uh, that content. Um, and for the most part, they don't comply with 
media laws or publishing laws in the countries in which they are available, even if they're not operating in that country. Similar thing with, uh, with Uber, uh, who claims they're not a taxi service. They're just a matching service for independent drivers and people who may need to share a car to get somewhere. It's to escape the uh, regulation. It's not that I don't believe governments have no right to regulate the internet. You know, you know, you know governments have the right to do the, what they want inside their geographic borders. My concern starts being when uh, the laws inside a geographic border are now expanded globally, which is what I'm seeing you know, happening with Germany and with some of the EU regulations. And then, you know, that, uh, that's a slippery slope because of very legitimate governments do that. It, it gives a good excuse for totalitarian or you know, governments on the edge a bit to do the same thing under the same guise, and we see that happening. For example, the uh, you know the EU has been at the forefront of uh, protecting people's privacy uh, on the internet. You got GDPR coming, and and, and you and you've got some others. But in the past, you know, there's been a rule that uh, data on EU citizens really needed to be kept in the EU. <laughs> You know, and they had what they considered uh, legitimate reasons for that, privacy reasons. Some of it is probably also, frankly, um, financial and political reasons. But now that has cascaded. After the EU does it, um, Russia does it. Russia may do it for a different reason, which is if you have all of the data for a social media user required to be kept in country, which now means it's hosted by domestic telecoms, then all of that data is now available easily for the government and the citizens have now lost privacy. So you've got Russia doing that, you've got Brazil doing that, you know, and most of them just use the excuse, well, the EU did it, so why can't we? So it's a, it's a dangerous step. And, uh, you know, I think we got to think about the repercussions of that as you try to regulate within a country and then as you try to enforce your country's mores and morals on the rest of the world's um, internet users. Thank you. I think uh, you've been listening uh, very well, thank you. Um, let's hear from you. Uh, what are your questions, perhaps, and any thoughts? Well, briefly, and introduce yourselves. Uh, Yaroslav Angel, Anglo-American University. I have a comment and a question. Yes. Uh, we heard that uh, internet, digital, digital technologies are tools, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also heard uh, th there are a medium. And uh, Marshall McLuhan argued that the medium is the message. That means tool has certain properties which shape what we are doing, what we are thinking. Now, it's clear that the internet and digital technology is doing two things, and you mentioned one, amplifying things, yes? The other thing is accelerating things. We see tremendous acceleration all over, right? And, and so, that's what you have on one hand. On the other hand, we have values, morality, laws, and these things don't change quickly. That takes long time, long term. So you have here a fundamental tension or conflict. And I would like to ask you how you would address that tension, that conflict, that contradiction. Thank you. Let's take two more questions. And Maybe I should, Vladimir Benacek, Charles University. Maybe I should address another issue of technology. Technology means knowledge. Knowledge means certain rationality and knowledge embodied in certain human products, that's called technology. And technology can, need not be only material. It can be very soft. It can be, for example, psychological technology. So my question is, what do you think? How rationality or knowledge can destroy humanity? Thank you. Any other questions? If not, yes, there's one more there and then I didn't realize that you were going to focus so much on social media, and I do appreciate what you have had to say, but I have a question about other technology that perhaps you might consider as well. 
If we are having robots and many different technologies replace people, when and how are we going to do something to make those people's lives meaningful? What are they going to do? Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons I think there's a real issue for the question of democracy and populism, is who are these people who are being dispossessed and how many more of them are going to be dispossessed? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's take uh, some responses from uh, all of you. Well, um, Any question that uh, you like? I thought the first and the third questions are kind of the same. I think those are both really great questions, especially the first one. And it's something I, ad again, address in my book. I think the gentleman, sorry, what was your name again? Where are you from? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, his point was that we've got two things going on at the same time. We've got technology moving ahead really, really fast. And the lady said the same thing. Um, and it's not just the internet. The internet, even today, I think is a word, is kind of archaic. It's very old fashioned. We've got artificial intelligence. We've got virtual reality. We've got augmented reality. We've got the internet of things. We've got a, an entire, everything is changing. And so that's moving really fast. It's being driven by Moore's law, which is Gordon Moore's famous observation in 1965 that the power of a computer chip would double every 18 months. Uh, and then we have, as the gentleman said, the problem that human beings have kind of stayed the same. So what are we supposed to do? Well, this technology is moving ahead at a crazy speed. Thomas Friedman called it the age of acceleration. I think it's a good definition of where we're at. So what do we do as human beings? This was the question that the lady said. It's a question of humanity. What I do in my book is I invent a new version of Moore's law, but rather than Gordon Moore, the Intel co-founder, my Moore's law is Thomas Moore, the uh, author, the 16th century Englishman and author of Utopia, who has a different notion of law, Moore's law, which I think drove him to write Utopia, is about agency, is about reminding ourselves that what defines us in contrast with all these new technologies is our human agency, our ability to set goals and to create things. Now, the one thing that all this new technology can't do, whether it's AI or the internet or um, uh, or, or virtual reality, it can't think for itself. Whatever the dystopians tell you, it can't think for itself. It can't do what we do. It can't have agency. So the answer to your question, and it's the great challenge, I think, of the 21st century, and it's one that, I, that, that shapes my book, is how do we remind ourselves of Moore's law, Thomas Moore's law in human beings, how do we empower us to actually uh, master this technology and build societies with this? Some of the technology is amazing for our own interests. And, and that's the great challenge. There's no easy solution. There's no app for that. We have to do it ourselves. We have to stand up and shape our futures like we always have done throughout history. This isn't a unique moment. We've done it before and we have to do it again. Thank you. President. Um, I, I also agree with the, uh, uh, the particular, the first question about uh, acceleration, acceleration uh, of the, the technology. Um, but then, uh, as many uh, sort of on the social, um, the human, even our sort of psychological and biological, yeah, uh, about uh, the uh, evolution, it's not that fast, right? Uh, that's why we're in such an anxiety and uncertain uh, uh, context. The, uh, I do not have a solution, uh, but I do think there's a pressing issue. Uh, that we, you know, that's why we're here, that's why we're focusing on it, that's why I make us to asking the deeper question, who are we and where we're going? Uh, why we invent those things and what these things do to ourselves? Uh, and what is the next generation and the future generation that would be like. This is not only about social media, it's about you know, big data, internet of things, artificial intelligence, uh, driving, and you, you name it. Yeah, this world is fascinating and accelerating. Yeah, at the same time, they're impacting every bit of our life. So I, I thank you for the question, and I share the question, I don't have an answer. 
I think the, um, the third question was uh, addressed a little bit in a um, breakfast I went to this morning, which was about uh, Trump and Brexit, which is kind of the realization that the core of the Brexit voters and the core of the Trump voters were essentially the people who got left behind, and not by the current move towards what we think of, you know, current high tech, but the, you know, the loss of the big industrial belts in the UK and in the uh, US, both with competition from Japan in the 60s and 70s, China later, and frankly, you know, uh, factory um, automation. You know, even one generation ago, the father, the job my father did, uh, he was a machinist and then a tool and die maker, um, that doesn't exist anymore. You know, but uh, in the 60s, you know, he could raise a family of five kids working as a machinist. Um, and, but you have huge swaths of the U.S. and the U.K. and probably eventually China who are left behind by the industrialization. And it's not that, you know, current technology is doing anything different. I mean, you can go back to the old, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution a couple hundred years ago and everyone who got left behind, each time we get a new wave of technology, a big swath of people get left behind. And, um, you know, the political parties are not addressing uh, their needs. And it's not that we're gonna be able to stop technology. In fact, maybe this is, you know, really uh, the important thing for governments to be focusing on. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the, the message in the parties has been so much, hey, uh, internationalization and industrialization is here to stay. It's up to you as a person to adapt to it. Uh, and I think a big lesson out of Brexit and Trump, at least from my mind, I'm not a politician, is that we have completely forgotten about the people who are being left behind uh, by these advances and how do we keep them engaged in society and productive in society uh, because quite often those are the folks who now end up being the ones who are ranting and raving on social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. More questions? You had one, Tim? Thank you. My name is Blake Huber. I'm from Denver, Colorado. And first of all, Mr. Keene, I want to let you know I've pre-ordered your book. Okay. I look forward to reading it. Uh, I am an advocate ad activist, so I enjoy social media. I use it every day to find people who think like me, uh, to find my tribe, so to speak. So I'm going to ask a different question of the topic. Not will technology destroy democracy, but will democracy destroy technology? Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Martin Gärtner from the Austrian Embassy here in Prague. Um, it seems that technology on the one hand side is very globalized already, whereas democracy on the other side lacks a global demos. Where do you see um, possibilities to organize that global demos? Would it be the UN, some sub-organization of the UN, or will it be looking completely different? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that very profound questions. Uh, would any one of you like well, to go I first? Think, yes. uh, the, the, the question, the, the second, I, I don't know, I didn't really understand the first question. I mean, it's in intriguing, but I don't really know what that means. I appreciate you buying my book, though. Um, the, the gentleman from Austria is a great question because this is the real irony of what's going on is that the technology was designed to be global but McLuhan got it, McLuhan really understood this medium better, you know, he of course is famous for the medium is the message but he, 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 he understood this stuff, he was very cynical about this new world and he came up with the notion of a global village now, to most people, the notion of a global village means that we all live in, we, the world lives in this global village. The, the world gets shrunk. But actually, I don't think he meant it like that. I think what he meant was that the, the world would be turned into a vast electronic village, a pre-industrial age where we reacquire the values of the village. And that's ironically what's happened with this new world is you're right in a way the, the technology is global but it's meaningless it, because it's not that's not how it works it's actually and this comes back to some of the things we've been talking about it fragments more and more it creates echo chambers 
Ultimately, it, it just comes down to the self, to the individual. Uh, it explains a lot of the atomization and alienation and disorientation of today's world. But what it's doing is fragmenting. What it's doing is isolating. What it's doing is tearing people apart. And the real answer, I think, to, to, to this universal idea, which everybody, I think, here probably shares, I know the moderator articulated it very clearly at the beginning, the real, um, solu the real way to universal communities, to a global community, is not through technology. Technology fragments. The only way to do that is through events like this, through the physical. And I think my prediction of the future is that, that these universal values will be reinvented around the analog technologies, around physical events like this. In the same way as music lovers have rediscovered vinyl, in the same way as kids now are writing in books, the digital does not create universal values. It undermines them. So, where for most of us, some of you are nodding, we, we want global values, we have to use other kinds of technology, and I think that there are analog ways and physical ways in particular. Thank you. Um, I actually want to uh, point out uh, another aspect of, uh, if you want to call the challenge uh, to democracy or to civil society, to uh, fundamental human rights and freedom which we, we uh, sort of, we touched upon it, we haven't said too much, about uh, surveillance and invasion of privacy and the state control over the individuals. Uh, I, I used the word asymmetry before, that individuals uh, uh, have the capacity in this technical empowered world uh, uh, different than the states or even in the big companies, right? Uh, uh, like that gentleman, I am also an activist. I do seek my tribes online and see that's the empowerment factor. But then uh, you realize that uh, the states or, or, or the large corporation companies or certain sort of people who possess the technology uh, uh, has far more power yeah, uh, uh, in, in, in this new world. Um, the, let's see, I, I, my jet lag, I couldn't think of the movie's name, which I didn't see, but somebody told me that in August there was a, a, a Hollywood movie called, uh, what's it called? But anyway, my friend saw it and, and he said, oh, this movie, uh, you should see it. I said, why? He said, oh, it's a science fiction. It's about uh, a future that Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Google, uh, Apple, all the company become one company. Uh, so then the, the superhero in the movie trying to save the mankind, right, in, the, in that kind of disorderly situation. And I heard that, I said, wait, 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 wait a minute. You mean those companies are becoming one company? China's already is. It's not a future, okay? In China, the states have access to all these companies, all this data, all this uh, 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 control over the individual lives right now. Yeah, we're not, it's not that far from future, right? Um, and that's a challenge for democracy and for fundamental human freedom. Mm -hmm. Jim? Well, I've got to absolutely agree with uh, Professor uh, Zhao, and that is my you know, single largest concern, not just with totalitarian countries, but with uh, democratic countries also. It's just so tempting to have access to all of that data. We hear an awful lot and a lot of blame about Russia and Russia spying, et cetera. And you know, kind of a lot of the things that some of the world's big democracies, like for example, the uh, US do, kind of gets uh, swept under the rug. Uh, you know, with so many of the um, you know, uh, disk drives uh, from um, you know, some years past uh, being infected such that the NSA could actually find out what's going on on, you know, tens of not hundreds of millions of computers uh, around the world. You know, so much spyware coming out of government agencies, uh, national police forces uh, or governments requiring uh, backdoor access to anything with cryptography or VPN. Um, shortly, for example, you know, to pick on Russia again, in Russia, um, we are a very popular product uh, in Russia, but Russia is shortly requiring that 
all VPN providers keep a list of all of their customers and every website that they visit to be turned over uh, any time the government asks, even without a court order. Uh, you get similar things happening in Brazil uh, and elsewhere. So it, it's, it's a slippery slope on all of this. And the amount of data commercial companies have on citizens, I think with the exception of China and probably Singapore, is far exceeds anything that a government has. Uh, yeah, the amount of data Facebook has on you, the amount of data Google has on you. And as the US recently learned with um, uh, you know, the latest revelation on some of the Kaspersky issues in the, uh, in the US, the amount of data a security company has on you um, is phenomenal. And that's just too tempting, too juicy of a target to most governments, no matter um, how liberal they are. And the, uh, the, uh, the gentleman from, uh, from Denver, I can't ignore that. My father's from Leadville, by the way, uh, just down the highway. Um, I think that you know, what causes a lot of this fragmentation that we're talking about in the internet is people searching out just their tribes. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know, so, so much of what we have here, it's really up to ourselves as citizens to solve. And it's reaching out to people outside our tribes. That's much more important than reaching out to people inside your tribes. I mean, myself, I read many newspapers every day, some in paper, some online, from the far right to the far left. And it's extraordinarily you know, valuable to me to, to know all those viewpoints. And um, uh, I think if, uh, you know, I don't think we're gonna solve all of this issue with regulations. It's gonna require people actually acting responsibly and reaching out across tribes. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, Probably pretty damn difficult. <laughs> Leave it to the people. Um, let's come to asking uh, the three of you about uh, your thoughts about the direction in which we'll find a solution or what may be the solution. And Andrew, I might begin with you, but you already thought about it and written the book. I'll also buy it, by the way. I bought your previous one. And, uh, but you're going to have to say something. Uh, Maybe it's in the book already. Well, the actually, yeah. Um, and, and this is a follow on, actually, from. From, from particularly what Vincent said, I, um, my, my, again, without wishing to promote the book too much, but I think there are experiments going on in the world today which are essential. Uh, the one that I focus on in a chapter I spent um, quite a long time in Estonia. It's not ideal, I don't, are there any Estonians here? Uh, okay, well, what Estonia is doing is interesting. They're trying to rebuild a kind of social contract in a digital age between citizens and government. So Vincent's right. You know, most of us get a bit of a chill. It's creepy, the notion that governments know a huge amount about us. But that's the reality of the 21st century. Every, t every time we turn on one of these devices, and even if we don't turn it on, they know more and more about us. We have technology now, facial recognition technology, that can determine our sexuality, that will determine what we're thinking, where we're from, how long we live. All these things change fundamentally every industry, from insurance to transportation to healthcare to everything. So we have to acknowledge that is a reality, like it or not. This is the world that we're creating now. You know, Huxley famously called it in the this kind of world, a brave new world. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's, it's a reality we have to deal with. What the Estonians are doing is trying to build a new kind of social contract, saying, okay, we're going to know a lot about you. We accept that. You have to trust us. There's a level of trust in government in Estonia which is high, very high in the world. The Singapore, and I would disagree with Vincent on Singapore. He's, I mean, I would disagree with his implication that it's bad that the Singapore government knows so much about their people. He lumped Singapore and China together. I think Singapore and China are actually quite different. I don't idealize Singapore, it's certainly not a pure democracy, but it's fundamentally different from China. We're creating a kind of, and you know better, much better than this about me, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a digital 1984 with digital technology, which will know everything about the people in China and then reward them according to their political um, reliability. 
So my point in terms of a first solution is that we need to look at governments and their building of ID systems and new kinds of social contracts between the government and citizens in the building of a digital democracy. In Estonia, for example, the government acknowledges it knows more and more about people, but it also creates laws which doesn't allow the government to just look at data. And if the government does choose to look at your data, you will be notified. So we need new kinds of social contract. What is dangerous is that we cannot fall into a kind of libertarianism and say government is always bad, because it isn't. Some government is good. The Estonian government is good. The Singapore government, I think, is more good than bad. The Chinese government, in my view, is mostly bad. The Russian government is bad. The American government doesn't exist. So <laughs> the reality is, is that the only solution is through government. Two other quick fix. One other quick fix. I do have the answer to the gentleman from Denver. What did you say? That, uh, the, the, the will... will Democracy Will democracy destroy technology? destroy technology? I think that's something we've got to be really careful of because I think we're still in the 1950s. There's going to be a huge reaction. I already see it. I wrote books against technology 10 years ago and everyone thought I was an elitist and blah, blah, blah. Now I'm in the mainstream. Now I'm talking about solutions. The danger we have now is not overreacting to the problems of technology. The, the, what, the challenge is to be moderate, to understand that technology is a tool. And it may not be neutral, but it reflects our own values. And the challenge is neither to vilify it or idealize it, to use it according to our own interests, which goes back to Moore's law. So the ultimate challenge is to rebuild our agency in the digital age. Thank you. Uh, Solution. <coughs> My quick fix is yes. uh, Rita Tagore. Rita Gore. Yes. Uh, don't forget our humanity. Uh, the second is do and use technology and try to understand the technology and try to participate and influence yeah, uh, where the technology goes. Uh, and the third yeah, is becoming an activist. Defend yourself and fight for a better world. Thank you very much. Okay, two things. First, I was sloppy and uh, lumping in the same t sentence Singapore and China. I was lumping them together as examples of who knows a tremendous amount about their, uh, about their citizens, but of course they use it for different purposes. Um, um, but you know, even, in a, uh, even in a good country with a good government, uh, what Singapore clearly is and China most likely is not, uh, you know, people do worry about long term, even in um, um, uh, Estonia, where you, you, you're trusting the government right now, but data is basically forever. Are you going to trust the government 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? And how do you really kind of properly protect uh, both technologically and, um, uh, you know, through the, through the uh, political system? Um, but. You know, my probably number one quick fix, it's probably virtually impossible, is um, people need to, deta uh, need to um, read. Um, you know, in the U.S., the number one source of news, it's not social media, it's not online, it's TV news. And um, I think it's that lack of, of reading that really causes a lot of this... Um, um, shall we say, uh, lack of polite social discourse, etc. It's, um, uh, you know, we get such stratified opinions and uh, reading requires a lot more analysis, a lot more thought, a lot more involvement, once again, as you get from Marshall McLuhan, than uh, listening to uh, talking heads on the TV. And I think that would go a long ways. And it doesn't have to be reading paper, it can be reading online. I mean, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the top uh, news sites in the U.S. online get far more readership than newspapers do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, here's what um, I have um, heard is solutions, and I'm stringing them together because they build on each other and they connect very well, I think. Uh, let me start with Thomas Moore's Law, which I haven't read your book, but about human agency human agency, and I think this is what distinguishes a human being from other animals. 
our sense of that we can shape our destinies, we can shape the world around ourselves to make it a better world for ourselves. So we shape institutions with which we can regulate the world around ourselves. And I think one of the greatest technologies or inventions of human beings has been institutions, different forms of institutions, business institutions and government institutions mm. with which we can regulate uh, the world around ourselves. And the shaping of new institutions uh, must uh, be based on our aspirations for what we want in the world. And so we have to listen to our own aspirations and the aspirations of others because we have to shape a world collectively. And so what you said very well, uh, uh, Andrew, was uh, we need to go back to analog technologies about human beings, listening to each other, even though we may have differences. And if we want to make a larger world, a more global world, we are going to have to listen to people who are very different to ourselves, with whom we haven't grown up necessarily. So the art and the technology of listening and having a dialogue with people not like ourselves is what we must uh, develop. And with that, uh, we may develop um, a better democracy in which there's more consideration for many points of view and the ability to come to conclusions, starting with many points of views. And oh, is technology, uh, the word is not neutral, but we invent technology, we use technology, we regulate technology, and I think we need an application of better democracy to regulate technology. So I might even change the title of the session, which was, Will Technology Destroy Democracy? I would say, Will Democracy Regulate Technology? Yes? Good. And I think that, that may be a good conclusion. And thank you very much, and thank you, all thank of you. you. Thank you. Thank you.